this morning? A little bit louder. Do you love the Lord this morning? I hope that you come to worship Him. Would you stand please all across the house? Let's get ready to worship and to sing and to praise Him. John chapter 3 and verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Today is about love. I know it's, it's Valentine's Day and all of that, but God loves you. He has a purpose and a plan for you. And all you have to do is yield yourself to it. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this day, God. For your love and your kindness, Father, and for all your many blessings. I pray, Father, that you would have your way in our hearts and lives this morning. Give us wisdom and direction as we go forward, Lord, and know the music as it's being sang, Father. Lord, and know the word as it comes forward. In Jesus' name we pray.
hope you do. Um, because he is here. If you're sitting there, especially all y'all in the back, you say, I don't feel nothing. You might need to move up front. Because I feel him up here. But it all has to do, yeah, in the back. They feel him in the back. It has to do with us. He's always there. He's always with us. How open our heart is, though, determines our relationship with him. Thank you, praise team. Happy Valentine's Day. You may be seated. Or for some of you, happy Singles Awareness Day. Because you're never more aware of your single status until Valentine's Day rolls around, right? In the spirit of Valentine's Day, I want to tell you a story about a young man in love with a young girl. And he's determined to win the affections of this lady. Um, but this lady has refused to talk to him anymore. Maybe he's a stalker. Maybe he's a creeper. Maybe he's just not her type. I don't know. She's like, dude, I don't want to see you. I don't want to talk to you. But he's determined to win her everlasting love. So he decides that since she won't talk to him, that the way to her heart is he's going to is going to be have to be through the mail. So he begins to write her love letters. He writes a love letter every single day to this lady. Six, seven times a week, she receives a love letter in the mail. Y'all, that's some commitment right there. <laughs> some commitment. But she doesn't respond. And when she doesn't respond to all of this mail, he increases his output. He begins to send her three notes a day, every single day. So she's receiving three love letters a day. In the end, he has written her more than 700 letters. Y'all, this guy does not know when to give up. Okay? 700 letters, 700 deliveries to her house, and she ends up marrying the postman. Stop it. So today we are going to, in the spirit of Valentine's, examine a love letter from a minor prophet. We're going to be looking at Hosea today. Now the minor prophets, they refer to the final 12 chapters in the Old Testament. And the term minor prophet only refers to the length of the book, not to their importance. So don't think that the story that Hosea is saying is any less important than what Isaiah wrote chapter after chapter after chapter after chapter, okay? Minor does not mean minor in significance, all right? So a little background for, for those who may not be familiar with the bigger story, the bigger biblical story. God called a man named Abraham. And it was through Abraham that God declared he was going to form a nation. He's going to build a nation. And thus began the nation of Israel. All right. God began to reveal to this nation, to these people, the nature of life. He roots them in his love. He, he begins to reveal who he is to them and who they were meant to be. And their faithfulness becomes this cycle of Failing and learning and then returning to God. And then failing again, learning a lesson, and returning to God. But now at this point where we're going to pick up, it seems that they have lost all signs of any real faithfulness. They may have some, some mild forms of, of an outward religious life, but no real faithfulness. All right? And just like any other condition like this, the unfaithfulness, it comes slowly. It, this didn't just happen overnight. The nation of Israel was not on fire for God one day and cold to him the next. This is a, a matter of daily choices, step by step, as you move away from God. And just so you know, the nation of Israel is not the only ones who do this. All right? We're all open to, to, to making bad choices. To, to not doing our best every single day to follow after the one true God. Now, 
Israel is propped up by some alliances that they have made with Assyria and with Egypt. They were enjoying some prosperity at this time, which probably further led to their compromise, if we'll be honest. Okay, So these human hearts, these chosen people of God, they began turning away from God and turning towards others. All right, And it may have all begun with a little bit of ooh and ah and Look what the Joneses have, and look at that big boat they just bought, and, and look at that house they're moving into, and look at the upgrades that they're doing. And then believing that it would serve some needs to them, to their families, to their nation. And then they were slowly redirecting their hope, redirecting their trust. God knows where this leads. God knows the end story here. And it's during such a time as this, that God has raised up some prophets. So let's listen to the opening verse of Hosea. Hosea chapter 1, verse 1. It says, The Lord gave this message to Hosea, son of Beeri, during the, during the years when Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah were kings of Judah, and Jeroboam of Joash was king of Israel. Now this is a pretty simple opening, not, you know, if you read over this and glance over it, it's like there's nothing that's going to jump out to you like, whoa, there's, 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 there's really deep here, okay? But this simple opening statement kind of, it sets everything up in historical context, okay? This, as we read right here, is the interplay of God in historical life. God had a prophet in place during the times of these kings. And if you go back in, in a history book, you can, you can find out when these kings ruled. And that, that the history book that you read in school may not say much about Hosea, but just by looking at the history of these kings, you know when Hosea lived and when he worked his ministry. That secession of kings helps us realize that, that Hosea has served as, as God's voice to the people for many years. Um, it's thought it was 30 to 60 years, somewhere in that time frame. But the book of Hosea, the whole book, is a compilation of those years that he served. And when it begins, he's a young man. As a young man, I'm sure he looked forward to beginning his life, to, to having a wife and having children, and entering into a stage of life where he could, he could walk down the street as a respected adult, in his hometown. And it's during this season of his life that we pick up in verse 2. It says, When the Lord first began speaking to Israel through Hosea, he said to him, Go and marry a prostitute, so that some of her children will be conceived in prostitution. This will illustrate how Israel has, has acted like a prostitute by, re by turning against the Lord and worshiping other gods. So Hosea married Gomer. Now, some of you may be sitting there thinking, did she just say what I think she said? Did that Bible just say what I thought it said? Yes. That is exactly what it says. What we discover is that people, they, they lost their responsiveness to God. They didn't respond to God like they had. And it, it, as I said earlier, it happened over time. The priest even, they had ceased to, to root the people in the truth. They had ceased to, to turn people towards God. And so God comes to this faithful young man. Now, this prophet is not going to be just a, an oracle, idea, a oracle of ideas. He's not just going to be the voice of God. This prophet is going to bear the message in life, through the life that he lives. He's not just going to describe the reality of the people's spiritual adultery. He's not going to just describe their unfaithfulness. He would become a living symbol of it. Um, just put yourself in Hosea's, in Hosea's Birkenstocks or shoes or sandals, whatever he wore. Put yourself there. Imagine what he faced, okay? He was called by his God to choose a life of utter disgrace and pain. Chosen by a loving God 
to live this kind of life. Because, you know, as soon as you take her as your wife, she's going to leave you. She's going to cheat on you. She's going to love other men more than she loves you. She's going to find her satisfaction with others. She's going to lack appreciation for you. And she's going to make you the biggest punchline in town. So we can imagine how in the day, during the daytime, he sought the Lord. And he warned the people. And he was doing his job as a prophet. And then night after night, Hosea returned home wondering where his wife was. Night after night, he lay awake, waiting for, his, waiting for his wife to return, or maybe going out and searching for her. We're told that she bore three children. It's just right after the verses I just read. The first child was a son, and God instructed Hosea to name him Jezreel. Now, if you're familiar with your Old Testament scripture at all, this name has significance, okay? Okay. The name Jezreel was the name of a city that had played a tragic part in Israel's history. You want to read up on that, go back and read about Elijah and King Jehu. And I'm not going there this morning, okay? And then they had a second child. It was a little girl. And God told him that they were to name her Loruamah, which means no mercy or not loved. Can you imagine walking around with that name all, all your life? And then after little Laruama was weaned, they had a third child. It was a second boy. And he was to be called Lomi, which means in Hebrew, no kin of mine. Maybe Hosea knew this wasn't his son. Maybe God was saying, you're not my people because you've turned away from me. Either way, in this household, God displays his love for us in some very powerful ways. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. The first truth that Hosea is showing us this morning is the love of God is profoundly undeserved. Profoundly undeserved. You know, the people around him, um, the people around Hosea, they must have related to him with the question, How can a holy and faithful man like you love an adulterous woman like her? How can you love her? Dude, you know she's cheating on you. And I believe that Hosea has realized that his answer in itself is a bigger question. And his answer would be, how can a holy God like ours love such an adulterous nation as us. Can we just flip the switch this morning? Flip that that mirror around to where we're looking at ourselves this morning? How can you love an adulterous woman like that? How do you think God loves an adulterous person as me? They found his love for her shocking. They found it appalling disgraceful she didn't deserve it not realizing that it was only a mild picture of their own unfaithfulness they're they're looking she is representing them as a nation and they don't they don't get it she's representing how undeserving they were of the love of God they were living out a deeper adultery spiritual adultery to God And God confronts the adultery of giving our ultimate trust and hearts to another. Of turning to other sources to ultimately provide and satisfy our hearts. Spiritual adultery turns our honor from the one who gives. It turns our honor to idols. You may say, well, I don't have any golden calves in my house. I don't have any idols set up like, you know, statues. I I don't go around and worship. Don't you, though? Maybe you can sit there and not get struck by lightning and tell me that you have absolutely nothing in your life that you ever, ever place above God. You don't have a spouse. 
that you love more than God. You don't have kids that you put before your relationship with God. You don't have a job that you, you run after instead of running after God. You don't have material things that, that you think about and that you want, that you, you strive to get. We all have idols. We have all been unfaithful. Hosea 2.8 says, She doesn't realize it was I who gave her everything she has, the grain, the new wine, the olive oil. I even gave her silver and gold, but she gave all my gifts to Baal. Spiritual adultery. Giving trust to those who will only use us and enslave us. Also in Hosea 7 and 11, it says, The people of Israel have become like silly, witless doves, first calling to Egypt, then flying to Assyria for help. And then we read again in Hosea 12 and 1, the people of Israel feed on the wind. They chase after the east wind all day long. They pile up lies and violence. They are making an alliance with Assyria while sending olive oil to buy support from Egypt. When I consider the, this type of unfaithfulness to God, I am faced with a pretty horrifying truth. I am Gomer. We are Gomer. There is unfaithfulness in all of us. Every last one of us. But you know what's so good? What is so great? What is so awesome? Is God's love is not rooted in us. God's love is rooted in himself. You know, when I say, I love you, and you refuse to love me, then I hurt because I've lost something, okay? Like the young man that we started this with, with all the love letters. When God says he loves you and you refuse to love God, God hurts too. Not because God has lost something, but because you have lost something. I want you to think about that for a moment. That, that is the perfection of, of his love. If we choose not to lose something, God is just fine. Breaks his heart. But we're the ones who lose. We're the ones who miss out. We miss out on relationship. We miss out on salvation. We will miss out on heaven because we're all going to have eternity. The great thing is we get to choose where we spend it. God's love is not merited, it's not warranted, it's not bound by any need. Now this, this grows even more dramatic as Hosea is called to even greater grace. And you, you may be thinking, what else is he going to put him through? What else has Hosea got to go through? Gomer appears to have sunk lower and lower until she falls into the hands of a man who does not care for her at all, all right? That man decides that he's going to sell her into slavery. Now, in the ancient world, slavery, it was an established institution. It was rampant. I mean, that, that was just normal, okay? There was hardly a city that didn't have a place where men and women were bought and sold. It was just commonplace. And so we read at the start of Hosea chapter 3. It says, Then the Lord said to me, Go and love your wife again, even though she commits adultery with another lover. This will illustrate that the Lord still loves Israel, even though the people have turned to other gods and love to worship them. So I bought her back for 15 pieces of silver and five bushels of barley and a measure of wine. Imagine the scene. Here we go. Let's put ourselves in, in Hosea's sandals again, okay? Okay. Gomer is led up to the slave block, the auction block, okay? And then folks notice on the edge of the crowd, hey, there's Hosea. This ought to be good. What would we say today? We're going to get some tea. We're going to stir the pot. We're going to find out something. People get excited. I want to see how this plays out. And you can just hear the gossip. Well, he's come to see her get what she deserves. Because, you know, 
here to see her get her punishment, here, here to see her being sold into slavery because that's what she deserves. That's where she needs to be. And then the bidding begins. And someone says, I'll give you 10 pieces of silver for her. Somebody else, I'll give you 12. And Hosea says, I'll give you 15. And somebody else says, well, I'll give you 15 pieces of silver and, and, and a bushel of barley. And Hosea comes right back. I'll give you 15 pieces of silver, five bushels of barley, and a measure of wine. And the gavel sounds, and Hosea pushes forward through the crowd to buy his wife. Now, he doesn't go there to buy her to punish her. Hosea goes there to buy her to redeem her. And then he tells her, he says, You are to live with me many days. You must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any other man, and so I will live with you. So what Hosea is saying here, something like this. Okay, he's saying, I bought you, and now I want you to live with me. I want you to be faithful to me, and I promise that, that whether you are faithful to me or not, I will be faithful to you. Whether you're faithful to me or not, I will be faithful to you. And maybe you're thinking this morning, how could, how could any man, how could any person do that? I mean, how could any man go before a crowd that knew him? He was a known man. They know his life. And buy his wife to nurse her back to purity. How could anyone do that? And the answer to that is found in verse 1 of chapter 3 of one of the greatest sentences in the Bible. I just read it. Then the Lord said to me, Go and love your wife again, even though she commits adultery with another lover. This will illustrate that the Lord still loves Israel, even though the people have turned to other gods and love to worship them. Go and love your wife again. Every soul was created to be rooted in love. We were not created to be loners, to, to live on all these individual islands, to never come in contact with anyone, to never love or to ever be loved. That's not how God created us. You know, we value being affirmed for what we do, but, but nothing that we do can prove our worth. Nothing. There's nothing we can do to prove our worth. You are not loved because you have value. You have value because he loves you. God values what he loves. The second thing that we learn about God's love to Hosea is that the love of God will allow us to face the consequences. Listen to what God says. It's Hosea 2, 7 through 9. It says, when she, loved, when she runs after her lovers, she won't be able to catch them. She will search for them but not find them. Then she will think, I might as well return to my husband for I was better off with him than I am now. Kind of sounds like the prodigal son, huh? Hmm. She doesn't realize it was I who gave her everything she has. The grain, the new wine, the olive oil. I even gave her silver and gold, but she gave all my gifts to Baal. But now I will take back the ripened grain and new wine I generously provided with each harvest season. I will take away the wool and the linen clothing I gave her to cover her nakedness. The love of God will allow us to face the consequences of turning to things and turning to people which cannot fulfill us and which will ultimately destroy us. Because if we never face the consequences of our actions, where would we be? Not fit to be around anyone, I can tell you that. More spanking, less participation trophies. We're not going to go down that road. Okay, God knows that we can presume to understand the condition that we're in. We can, we can be like the proverbial frog in the kettle, if you will. We, we like the warm water, not realizing that the water is getting hotter and it's actually cooking us. 
All right. Still comfortable, but that temperature's raising. And we, we will be like that unless something wakes us up. So he allows that which will wake us up. Whatever that is in your life, whatever that is in your situation. Sometimes we refer it as, as tough love. Tough love. It's not a matter of removing our choices from us. It's a matter of allowing us to face the reality of those choices. We still get to make the choice. Do I go right? Do I go left? Do I open this door? Do I open this door? We have the choice but we also get to face the reality or the consequence of that choice. And that, whether we can see it or not, is a gift from God. You know, there's always hope when there is a call for change rather than just a final dismissal. I am so glad that God just does not give up on me. That he does not just say, okay, I've, I'm done, I've had enough, she's never going to change, so... He doesn't, he doesn't write me off. There's always hope. Which brings me to number three. The love of God offers new hope. Hosea um, chapter 2, starting in verse 14, it says, But then I will win her back once again. Now, I want you to go and read this later and pay attention to the I wills, Okay. Listen to them as I read them, but go back and study those. I will win her back again. I will lead her into the desert and speak tenderly to her there. I will return her vineyards to her and transform the valley of trouble into a gateway of hope. She will give herself to me there as she did long ago when she was young, when I freed her from her captivity in Egypt. When that day comes, said the Lord, you will call me my husband instead of my master. O Israel, I will wipe the many names of Baal from your lips, and you will never mention them again. On that day, I will make a covenant with all the wild animals and the birds of the sky and the animals that scurry along the ground so they will not harm you. I will remove all weapons of war from the land, all swords and bows, so you can live unafraid in peace and safety. I will make you my wife forever, showing you righteousness and justice, unfailing love and compassion. I will be faithful to you and make you mine. And you will finally know me as the Lord. I will be faithful to you and make you mine. What is it we always say at Valentine's? Be mine. God said it first. God is saying, I'm going to lead her out of the wilderness. I'm, I'm going to allow her to, to stumble into the valley of trouble. And there, in that awful, dreaded place, I will open up to her the door of salvation and hope. Because hope is powerful. And what God did for the nation of Israel... God will do for you. God will do for me. God will do for this nation. Sometimes when we persist in our running and, and, and going astray and, and just running wild, it's almost as if God took his hands off of our lives and let us suffer and, and feel the consequences of what we did. Anybody ever felt that? Anybody ever been there? We stumble into the valley of trouble, a place of, of broken dreams and broken hearts and broken lives. But it is there, in that dreadful place, that God opens to us a gateway of hope. And you may know something about that valley, the troubles, the desert. It is a place of, of longing, and, and, and God here, he declares that there's going to be a better end, a future that will come. What does Jeremiah say? I will give you hope and a future. Our future is in him. Our future is not in the valley of trouble. And you can hear something of what lies beyond anything that they have known. It will last forever. 
It will be without violence and all conflict will be settled. He, he has come to the place where slaves are sold, even prostitutes, and he will buy them. God says that you were created in love. Since you were created in love, you can be redeemed in love. Titus chapter 3 verses 4 through 6 says, When God our Savior revealed his kindness and love, he saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Christ Jesus our Savior. Jesus Christ our Savior. If the praise team would come. I want to give you a story, another story. I know, whoa, she doesn't really do stories much. It's a, little, it's a story of a little boy who builds him a sailboat. All right? um, he takes it to the lake and he pushes it in and he's just hoping it's going to sail. Like float first and then work. Okay? And sure enough, this little wisp of a breeze comes through and it fills up the little sail on the boat and the, the sail begins to billow and it goes rippling along the waves. And suddenly, before the little boy knew it, the boat's out of his reach. So he wades into the water, even, and he's wading fast. But you ever, anybody tried to run fast in water? It don't work real well. But he's going as fast as he can in hopes to, to grab this boat. And as he's doing that, he's watching it float away. It's just gone. And he's hoping that at that point, the breeze is going to shift and it's going to bring the boat back. But instead, he watches it as it goes further and further out on this lake until it's just gone. And so he goes home crying, and his mom's like, what's wrong? Didn't it work? And he says, yeah, it worked too good. It worked too well. And sometime later, the little boy, he's downtown, and he walks past this secondhand shop window. And there in that window, he sees the boat. It's unmistakably his. And he goes in, and he says to the proprietor, he says, that's my boat. He walks up to the window and he picks it up and he's ready to, to leave with his boat. And the owner of the shop, he's like, wait a minute. Wait a minute, son. That, that is my boat. I bought it from someone. I paid for that boat. And the boy said, no, it's my boat. I made it. And he begins to show him like the little hammer marks and, and the scratches and, and where he had filed on the boat. And the man said, I'm sorry, son. He said, if you want it, you have to buy it. Now, we don't need to go out and find this man and beat him up because of how he's treating this little boy. Think about it. But poor little guy, he doesn't have any money. So he has to leave his boat there. And he goes and he works hard and he saves all of his pennies. And then finally, one day, he has enough money. And he goes back to this store, he goes in and he buys his boat. And he leaves the boat, or he leaves the store holding that boat close to him. And he's heard saying, you're my boat. You are twice my boat. First, you're my boat because I made you. And second, you're my boat because I bought you. If you ever think that you aren't worth much, just remember what God thinks of you. You are his. You are twice his. First, you're his because he made you. You are his by the right of creation. And then second, you are his because he bought you on a cross. He paid a price to redeem you. You are his by the right of redemption. You are twice his. And you may be crying this morning, if you would bow your heads and close your eyes. You may cry this morning from the depths of your heart. And, and you may be saying, where is God? Where is this almighty God? Where is he that I might know him? And the answer is straight from the book of Hosea. And it's that God is not lost. You are lost. He has pursued you up a hill called Calvary. And he pursued you through the tunnel of an empty tomb. And through the labyrinth that is life at this moment. He pursues you because he wants so much to make you his very own, twice his. Clovis Chapel 
was a noted preacher of, of the last century. And he told of a young man who lived in Chicago who went down to the bluegrass regions of Kentucky where he met and he wooed and he won this young woman. And ultimately he brought this young woman back to Chicago as his bride. They enjoyed three lovely years of marriage. And then one day in the midst of sickness, um, in a seizure of pain, the young woman lost her mind. I mean, at her best, she would be described as a bit demented after this, okay? At her worst, she would scream and yell and the neighbors would complain because all that noise was hard to live with. And so the young businessman, he left his home in the middle of Chicago and he went out to the western sur suburbs, he built a house, and he determined that there he would try to nurse his wife back to health and sanity again. And then one day, the, the family physician, he suggested that perhaps if he were to take his wife back home to Kentucky, back to those familiar surroundings, that it might would help to restore her sanity, her peace. And so they went back to the old homestead. Hand in hand, they walked through the old house where memories hung on every wall, around every corner. They went down to the garden and they walked down by the riverside where the violets were in bloom. But after several days, it seemed like nothing was happening. So, of course, he's defeated and he's discouraged. And this, this young man puts his wife back in the car and he drives back to Chicago. When they get close to the house, he looks over and he discovers that his wife was asleep. It was the first deep, restful sleep that she had had in, in many, many weeks. When he gets to the house, he lifts her out of the car, and takes her inside, and he places her on the bed. Puts a cover over her, and he just sits by her side, and he watches her through that midnight hour. He watched her until the first rays of the sunshine came and just touched her face. The young woman woke up. And she saw her husband seated by her side and she said, I seem to have been on a long journey. Where have you been? And that man speaking out of days and weeks and months of patiently waiting and watching said, sweetheart, I've been right here waiting for you this whole time. And if you ask me where God is, my answer is the very same. He is right here. He has been watching this whole time. He is right here speaking to you again. He is right here waiting for you to respond to love with love. Waiting for you to respond with trust to promise. Waiting for you to cast yourself with reckless abandon on the grace of God. Waiting for you to discover what it means to be loved by God according to the love that he demonstrated through the prophet Hosea. If you are ready to commit your life to him or to recommit your life to him, won't you respond to him today because he is waiting. If you say, I need to commit, I need to recommit, I need to set some things right, if you would raise your hand and put it back down. Amen, 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 amen. Thank you for honest hearts. Because there is not one person sitting here is perfect. No one's perfect. We all mess up. We all make mistakes. God does not love you because of what you do. God loves you in spite of what you do. God does not love you because of what you are. God loves you in spite of what you are. But when you understand how very much He loves you, then I ask that you respond to Him with love and praise and sacrifice and service. This morning, if you just want to tell Him that you love Him, that you appreciate His, His faithfulness to you through your own unfaithfulness, then I want you to come to the altar with those who said they were ready to commit or recommit their life. These altars are open. If you want to come and, and pray that sinner's prayer 
and ask for forgiveness and to repent, then come. And if you want to come and just say, God, I am so thankful that you love me. Lord, help me to never take that for granted. Then you come as well. Heavenly Father, we love you and we praise you. We lift you up and we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. choice whether we prostitute ourselves to to other gods or to idols or to just things of this world or if we will make the, the choice to pursue a relationship with it with him 
every day without fail. It's not a one time and done because y'all, I need him every day. I don't ask for forgiveness one time and then expect that I'm going to be perfect and I'm going to live my life the way God wants me to. I am human. I fail. And then I need him again. Just like the nation of Israel, they failed and then they learned and then they returned. It's a vicious cycle. And we can't judge them for that because we are them. We do the same thing. Amen. Um, I'm going to close us with prayer, but um, I, ho I hope that you will stay. Baptism service will begin as soon as we all get changed. Um, I'm assuming y'all have decided where you're going to change clothes. I don't know. There are, um, she's like, I'm ready. I'm ready to go. Um, there's, there's restrooms, and then the, those that are familiar, what, like with the church, you could go downstairs if you needed to, or just take turns in the restroom. What, Y'all work that out, okay? Um, but I want to close us with prayer, and then we will get ready to start baptism service. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for your redeeming love. Thank you, Lord, that you have never given up on us, that your grace and your mercy is new every day. Father, because we need it every day. Lord God, I just pray over your people today, Father, that you would lead God and direct them in their relationship with you and in the steps that they take and the choices they make. Father, keep your hand of blessing, provision, and protection on them. Father, I pray that you would, you would lead God and direct them in all that they say and all that they do. Father, I pray that we would realize that, that our thought life and how important that is, Father, because we follow our thoughts. And, and Lord, I just pray that you would teach us, Father, to stay centered on you and on your promises and on your truth. Lord God, I just praise you and I thank you for your goodness. 